All right, Mark, you just heard Don. Are you a fan of, like, several teams in the same market? Um, first of all, I just don't understand why you guys are just crushing people that are just, they just want to enjoy baseball. That's games. Don. Like don't someone, say you guys. Don. Let, all right, Don. <laughs> yes. Don, lay off these people. I mean, may, maybe not everybody in this world, their life revolves around sports. Maybe people just want to no, kick back after no, a long day at work or after no, no, no. the show and just watch a game with a hat on. Is that a big deal? So, so you would put Billy Crystal's a guy that just likes sports and is not an actual Yankee fan, as he was taking so in a Crystal's bat in a spring different. training he game. Is a, well, no, then, Billy Crystal's a Yankee fan. No, he, they, he's a fraud because it, and their, if you remember City Slickers, he's wearing a Met hat. It's a movie. <laughs> it's a movie that he it's, made. It's a movie that he wrote. Let me ask you. Let me ask you something. If somebody asks you to be in a movie, and we're going to pay you millions of dollars to act, because I know you've got some acting chops, Don. Thank I've you. seen it. If somebody offered you millions of dollars to wear a Red Sox hat or a uh, Patriots hat, would you do it? Yes, of course. That makes sense. Okay, but that, but go, that, but right. I'm not. Let's but that, this is playoffs. Billy Crystal. That's his movie, City Slickers. He didn't audition for that. It wasn't his first rodeo. Oh, I see what you did with rodeo. But you know what I'm saying? I mean, well he's done. Billy Crystal. I hear you. This is what I live with. I, I love this what I, I, I love. I Daniel know. Stern. Listen, he's got no choice in that movie. He's got to wear whatever hat he's told because he had no audition All for that part. Not Billy Listen, Crystal. I, I caught. I caught a very little bit of this conversation. Very All little. I know is that Larry David and Ray Romano are lovely men, and I don't care what hats they. They wear, I enjoy their well shows, said. and they're, they're fun guys to hang around, and I played golf with Ray, decent golfer, um, so let's move on. Hey, Mark, how are you? <laughs> hey. Yeah, you played a heck of a first base. Is that, I, you never broke out of Ray Romano. I never, I didn't know you had it. Uh, oh, wow. I still don't know what you do. Wow, playing golf with Mark Teixeira, wow. All right, can we move on to really important <laughs> thing? Real, real quick, by the way, <laughs> not yeah. City Slickers, not directed by Billy Crystal. But I think it, was written, it was written by well him. Done, uh, not well written, done. not written by Billy Crystal. Oh, really? Not directed by Billy Crystal. Starring Billy wow. Crystal. Wow, interesting. Just saying. Good thing we have Peter around. See, I got all the stats. Uh, don't you worry about it. I got it. All right. So, Mark, what did you think of the Yankee win yesterday? I thought that uh, you know every move Boone made worked out right. Impressive win. I mean, I think the the simple thing that you can say about the Yankees is this is the team that we expected to see when they're healthy. You know, we expected to see Aaron Judge hitting home runs. We expected to see Luis Severino attacking guys, um, you know, attacking the corners. We knew he didn't have to throw seven or eight innings pitch. So, you know, he really did exactly what the Yankees asked of him. My MVP of the game, though, is Dylan Batances. You know, here's a guy who last year wasn't even a, a factor in the playoffs, was persona non grata in the Yankees' bullpen, and he came in in a huge situation last night Bailed out Stevie and really set the tone for the second half of the game so the Yankees could pour it on and, and win very handily. So what's the... They obviously had don't leave anything to chance in these games analytically. So how much of a leash does a manager have in that situation? It, does, is he given a couple of options depending on the scenario? How much off the reservation can an Aaron Boone go in that, in, in that uh, type of a game? You know, that's a good question. I, I'm not exactly sure. I'm not privy to the conversations. Um, but, you know, I saw it in the dugout yesterday. Aaron Boone, when Chevy started struggling in the fifth inning, was talking to Josh Bard pretty much every other pitch, talking to Larry Rothschild every other pitch, basically saying, hey, you know, what do you guys think? And they had so many, so much information at their fingertips that they used the information, and then between Booney and Larry, Josh Bard, the bench coach, they make a collective decision. Yep, time to go get him. Let's let's put in the, the guy from the bullpen. Now, am I? I was talking with Mark to share his weekly spot on the K show. I, I really like the Yankees in this series against the Red Sox. I just do. I think the things that the Red Sox struggle with, the Yankees could actually capitalize on. What's your thoughts on this series? I do too. I mean, I think the Yankees win this series, and the reason I think that is, I'm not sure that Chris Sale is 100. Uh, percent Now, Alex Cora says he's fine. He says that he's 100%. But if you look at his four starts um, in September after he got off the DL the second time, his velocity kicked down every single start. And maybe that's just because the games didn't mean anything. He was you know, kind of going through the motions and he had no adrenaline. That, that could very well be the case. 
But if you listen to his comments saying I should be able to win with whatever I have, that doesn't sound to me like a guy who, who's at 100% has got all of his bullets. And if Chris Sale is not the guy that we saw for the majority of the season before his DL stands, and he's throwing 90 to 93 miles an hour, this right-handed Yankees lineup is going to tee off, and I think they win game one, and if they win game one, they win the series. All right, you're a player, so just read between the lines here on this question and answer from Chris Sale. Tell them about your success against the Yankees this year. Uh, no. So, <laughs> so what do you think's behind that? Just bad guy, or is there some sort of no. message there? Chris Chris Sale is not a bad guy. I think Chris Sale is tired of having everybody uh, talk to him or about him, about the Yankees, about his health, about he just wants to pitch. This is a baseball player, and guys like Chris Sale, you know, AJ Burnett was very much like this as well, um, kind of hot and cold with the media. You know, he he doesn't want to be in that media session, you know, trying to explain the Yankees and how well he's done. And he just wants to go out there and show it on the mound and pitch. So I don't take much of it. I think Chris Sale's a really good guy. He was probably um, he probably had enough of the uh, questions about the Yankees so far because he was getting asked them, you know, with the last month and a half when everybody knew that the Red Sox were going to win the division and the Yankees, you know, they were potentially going to face the Yankees in the wild card. They started asking him about the Yankees. Now, the Red Sox and the Yankees approached the game a little bit differently. They, they both uh, obviously score a lot of runs, but the Red Sox, they steal bases. The Red Sox also expect length out of their starting pitching because they don't have the underbelly of the bullpen that the Yankees have. And I think that against a Yankee team, that's not a good quality, Mark. Is Mark still there? No, that's the abduction sound. It was going to be a good question, too. And now, because the way my mind works, Don, I'm not going to remember what I was going to ask. He gone. Well, ask it now so that we can remember. All right, Mark, what, what I was saying is that one, one, one of the things the Red Sox do differently than the Yankees, they want their starters to go. They want length out of their starters to get as close to Kimbrell as possible. I don't think that works with the Yankees because the Yankees take pitches, they work the count, and all of a sudden you're going to have a high pitch count if you're price or sale in the fourth or fifth inning. And I think that's where the Yankees go to work in that bridge to Kimbrell. You're exactly right. And you better believe that the Yankees are talking about that amongst themselves. You know, Marcus Tens, the hitting coach of the Yankees, is saying, hey, listen, guys, you know, be patient. Make sure you're getting your pitch. Let's get these pitch counts up because – the only way that we lose this series is we expand the zone and let these starting pitchers go deep. If the Yankees get to the middle of the bullpen against the Red Sox in every single game, they have a great chance to win all those games. Uh, and I think that the Yankees are well-positioned because of their health, because of the emergence of Luke Voigt being a right-hander against you know, guys like Sale and Price in game one and two. They're in a great spot right now. By the way, uh, Billy Crystal, executive producer. Of City Slickers. Right. That makes him more important than everyone else. Well, he could have won anything he wanted. He was, the, he was certainly the money man. He could have won a skin suit if he wanted. <laughs> now, home field, Mark, uh, it's not something that ever really gets talked about in baseball, but certainly cost the Yankees, I thought, against the Astros last year. I think if they had home field, they would have won. Do you see it having any kind of a play here in this best of five? I don't think it is that big of a deal in this series. I think it's a much bigger deal in the next series against Cleveland or uh, Houston. Uh, the reason I say that is the Yankees, you know, Boston is almost like a second home to the Yankees. And they are, for as, as big of a deal it is to play in Boston, it's a lot of fun and the fans are in it and it's an electric atmosphere. It's all half to the Yankees. And, you know, you saw, the, you saw Houston come in there last year and, and win a couple games in Boston. Um, plenty of teams have gone into Boston in the playoffs and won games there. And, the, you know, the Yankees, it won't be, won't be any different for the Yankees. I think the reason that the Yankees have such great success at home is that Yankee Stadium is such a better place to hit for their team. I mean, all of their righties hit the ball the other way. You know, the lefties that are in their lineup are pool guys. You know, Brian Cashman has put his team together to hit well at Yankee Stadium. And when they're at home, they score a lot more runs. All right, we've got some um, text messages for you, Mark. Aldo from Hartsdale. What happens to Bird's crew at the Yankees if Voight helps lead them to a championship? <laughs> oh, man, this is tough. Uh, you guys know I've been a great Bird fan, but I, if Luke Voigt continues to play 
the way that he's he's played so far, you know, the last month and a half. I don't see any way he goes into next spring training without not being the Yankees starting first baseman. And you might see, I'm not saying it's going to happen, you might see a situation where um, the Yankees look at moving Bird in the offseason. As crazy as that sounds, Luke Floyd has, has proved himself to be a, uh, you know, a really established hitter here in the middle of this lineup and, and getting some big hits. And, you know, maybe he's a DH, but the problem with the Yankees, they have other DHs. Right. So, so if, if one of those guys has to play first every day, I don't, I don't see them platooning them next year. Ed McCormack from Valley Stream, New York, says, Big Mets fan, but I enjoy your perspective on baseball. What is your take on the A's starting a reliever? Do you think this can become a trend that picks up or where pitchers will pitch as a committee? Yeah. Let's be very clear. These teams are using the "quote unquote" clo- you know starter or uh, your bullpen game because they have to. If they had the Houston Astros starting staff, they'd start those guys every single day. And I think every team understands that when I have a quality starter and then dominant guys in the back end of the pen, seven, eight, and nine, that is my recipe for success. The, the Tampa Bay Rays and, and the Oakland A's and some of these other teams. Are, are pitching relievers early in games out of necessity, not because they think there's a competitive advantage. Um, let's see. Ellen from Mercerville, do you have any interest in managing? And if for some reason so Matt... Do, you... interest in managing. Um, I really enjoy the game of baseball from afar. I, I, I wouldn't want to, uh, you know, to be on the field every day. I wouldn't want to travel... I, I did that for a long time, and uh, I, I really just don't have any interest at all in managing. And also, she goes on, if for some reason Madden leaves the Cubs and they say he's not going to, do you think Joe Girardi would go for his dream managing job? Oh, I, I think Joe would definitely be a, a, you know, a, an option for the Cubs. I think one of the questions is, is what's Joe Madden's you know, future with you know, in Chicago? He got the vote of confidence yesterday, but... You know, if the Cubs have another kind of disappointing season next year, I can easily see them moving on. And there's going to be a lot of great candidates out there. I, I think the emergence of the front office and the analytics department basically running the team, it makes the manager less important um, on the field. And I think it makes him way more important in the clubhouse. And uh, I think the players, the front office in Chicago and all these different places, L.A. and, and some of the other jobs that are open, are really going to find a manager that, that has a good rapport with, with young players and, and can speak to the team and really get them to buy into whatever the, the culture is on that team. You, you know what I find amazing, too? Uh, there, was a, there was a report today, Mark, that Joe Girardi has interviewed for the Cincinnati Reds job. I find that stunning. I mean, he must want to manage so badly. The Cincinnati Reds job is not a great job. They're going to be bad for a long time. And they're not going to pay what he made with the... I mean, I guess there must be something in the blood for people that want to matter. Is that he's interviewing for that job, to me, is stunning. Yeah, you know, I think the same thing... It, it's not surprising to me, Michael. The reason is there are certain guys that love to coach, that love to manage. There are certain players that love to play. I mean, you know, the amount of, of great all-star caliber players that, at the end of their career, went back to the minor leagues just to try to hang on for a little bit and, and you know, get back to the bigs. Um, you see Matt Holliday with, with the Colorado Rockies did it this year. These guys just love baseball. And, and whether it's in Cincinnati or New York, if Joe Girardi wants to manage, he enjoys managing. He's a good manager. And he's had success. It's in his blood. And it doesn't surprise me that much that he would, he would take that interview. Well, you're, excuse me. You're talking about Greg Bird not really having a place on this team right now. He wasn't even on the roster last night. But... What's going on right now in a veteran Brett Gardner's mind? I mean, he knows that his Yankee days are probably numbered. He's an off-the-bench guy. As somebody who played in this game, a veteran in this game, what's going through his mind right now? So Brett Gardner, I don't worry about Brett Gardner's mind or his mindset or, or you know, how he's dealing with this because Brett Gardner has never been the man. He's never been the guy whose you know, who's hopes and dreams of a team were put on his shoulders and said, you know, Brett, you got to go out there and, and carry this team, whether it's for a week or a month of the season. And so he's always been a role player. Now, sometimes he's been a really great role pay- player. I mean, he had a, a really nice first half in 2015, made an all-star team, and, and he's a guy that at times can, um, can be a huge spark plug for a team. 
But Britt Garner has always been comfortable just being one of the guys. He's been comfortable doing whatever it takes to help his team win. And that's what's basically happening here this postseason. And he's going to start a few games. I think he'll get a few starts under his belt. He's going to come in as defensive replacement, as we saw yesterday. And I think he's fine with that. 